What's up, guys? I'm EJ. I'm joined by Kendall and a very special guest here for uh, this uh, special edition of New Generation Sports Talk. Um, Cody Topper, uh, assistant coach over at Memphis, joins us now. We're going to have a, a great discussion here talking not just about the Tigers, but about his, his career as a coach and, and some of the stops he's been at and, and what uh, we should be expecting when we're looking at players and, and, and evaluating players on this YouTube channel and podcast. So I want to uh, shout out Kendall, of course, who's with me as well. But uh, thanks, Cody, for hopping on the show. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, so I wanted to first, uh, you know, kind of go through your resume. So, you know, you you started, uh, you know, playing uh, basketball. You, you're one of the top three-point shooters in the history of the Ivy League playing over at Cornell. Um in your post-playing days, you end up getting uh, a, a job, you know, assistant coach with the, uh, the, the Houston Rockets G League team, the RVG uh, Vipers. From there, you end up going to be a uh, head coach in the G League with the North uh, Arizona Suns, and then you end up being on the, the staff there and the director of player development for heading over at Memphis. Do um, you want to just give us a little bit of a breakdown of how you went from uh, a player playing over at Cornell to, uh, you know, joining the Memphis Tiger staff and, and you know, a staff that's uh, a, for a program that's been, been very talked about for the last year or so since Penny came on. Yeah, no, um, you know, after I finished, I obviously had some solid individual success to help turn that program around. Um, I was able to play for eight years professionally. I think that helped, right? I won a G League championship. Uh, back then it was the D League uh, playing for Michael Cooper. I see we got a, you know, you got a, we got a Magic Johnson poster in the background there with Larry Bird. So, you know, Coop was like defensive player of the year on those Lakers teams. And then uh, after that, went overseas, won a Euro Challenge Championship playing in Germany, um, you know, played in Italy, Spain, all over the place. And so that really, that kind of just helped me broaden my horizons in terms of basketball, see basketball from many different perspectives. And when I finished, I actually started coaching prep school ball and training guys uh, with a guy named Gannon Baker, who's really the godfather of skill development. He's the guy who, has, has made it into really a profession. He was the first guy to make it as a skill trainer, um, as his main job, right, uh, in the private side, not on the team side. And so uh, we started a uh, prep school down in Delray Beach, Florida. And so I coached three teams. I coached 90 basketball games each year. Um, we had three high school teams. And then I also trained our NBA guys. And we had a great, you know, NBA pre-draft group. Uh, you know, that our first our first class, we had Shane Larkin, Robert Covington uh, and some other guys actually had Adonis Thomas also from uh, University of Memphis. Wow. Um, several Memphis guys have come through there. Matter of fact, including, you know, Joe Jackson, uh, you know, I've worked with Tark Black, think, you know, guys like that. But, uh, you know, we kind of cut our teeth there and uh, helping a guy like Robert Covington, uh, Royce O'Neal, who's with Utah Jazz and Tyler Johnson. Those guys went from unknowns you know, to 50 plus million dollar contracts, the largest contracts in the history of the NBA for undrafted players. And I think that that really sparked an interest uh, at the NBA level uh, in terms of what we were doing. Uh, and then my last pre-draft class that came through, we had Terry Rozier, uh, obviously, who's gone on and, and, and been highly successful. So, uh, you know, the Rockets uh, had, a, had an opening on their G League staff uh, and fortunate enough to be hired by Matt Brazzi, who to me is one, you know, one of the top up and coming basketball minds in the game. He's an assistant coach for the Rockets right now. And, you know, that RGV Vipers family, I mean, that's where Nick Nurse got his start, you know, coaching in the G League. Uh, you know, some, some other guys like Chris Finch, who's, uh, who's an assistant coach with the uh, New Orleans Pelicans now at this particular point, but also Joseph Blair from Philadelphia 76ers. Myself, I mean, we had an entire deep group of guys who went on to the NBA. And so that was awesome to be a part of. And then, you know, success breeds success. That's really what it's about, you know, and you got to make the big time where you're at. And so we treated the G League like it was the NBA. And lo and behold, you know, you know, three years later, I was coaching in the NBA. So it was uh, it was a fun ride. I definitely also felt blessed to be the head coach of the Northern Arizona Suns, the Suns G League affiliate. We led the league in call ups that year. I uh, also had a lot of really good offensive records that we set. And, uh, you know, it's just been a great journey. And then to get a call out of the blue to come join Penny Hardaway. Didn't know him, no affiliation, no connection, and just see what he's done, what he's built up, the buzz that he's got surrounding the program, but just his care that he has for the kids and, like, the servant mentality that he's really instituting with our guys to me is huge. Now, it's interesting you mentioned, obviously, your time in Memphis. Um, Obviously, in the uh, strange times that we're in now, obviously, we're both – we're all doing this interview remote. 
Um, and you, a lot of people have had to transition from working to home, uh, from working from home, uh, for you coaching from home. Uh, what have been kind of the, you know, maybe some silver lining that you found in terms of, you know, productivity and efficiency, uh, and you know, optimization that you found from working from home, you know, or coaching from home. As a player development guy, obviously you can't you know, be with your guys in person, but have you found other ways to be effective as a coach uh, that maybe more so than you would have been in other circumstances? Yeah, I think to me, you know, player development really is, is it's a threefold process, right? So, and, and just one of those folds is on the court, right? So then you've got the video element, which I think is huge and, uh, and underrated. You know, usually it's it, at the NBA levels where it really starts to become a part of your your diet really at the deepest levels on an individual level. So to me, uh, that's something that we focused on here at Memphis and something I think during the pandemic that we've, that we focused on is just helping give our guys the tools. And then the other thing is, you know, the mental side of the game, right. Which is, which is, uh, being mindful of, of people and understanding, right. Things like, you know, mental health and, and how to help promote, uh, just a healthy mindset for our guys, I think is huge. So during this pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to just take a step back, gain perspective. Obviously, the court piece is removed. But, uh, you know, what I love to do is I just send a text message over. For instance, the other day we were looking at with some of our point guards, Trey Young lob passes, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I send it to them and then just start the conversation. It's not a coach conversation. It's not, hey, tell me what you see. He did this read because of that. No, it's, it's tell me how you feel like in these in these such scenarios, right? Tell me what you think he was looking at in order to make this decision. And you just start a dialogue. And I think dialogue is huge, right? And so that's what we're doing. We're going to try to dive into those two elements until the NCAA allows us to return to the court. But it's also so, – sometimes it's not a bad time to just take a step back and just, you know, kind of cleanse yourself of not just a season, but, you know, voices can get tired. And, and uh, I think it's important for everybody to come back refreshed. And how have you how have you guys transitioned from a recruiting standpoint, having, you know, trying to recruit from, you know, you can't obviously bring people on campus and it's it's, it's a much different experience, I would imagine. Yeah, no, we've uh, we've 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 really kind of jumped headfirst into these Zoom uh, visits and uh, we've got a great presentation. I think that ultimately it doesn't it doesn't totally replace the ability to be on campus and and you know see the sights and the smells and the sounds and all that stuff but at the same sense i think it gives you an understanding of what we're about uh at, at the university of memphis and at the you know more specifically the men's basketball program so for us you know we've just we, we we've decided to just use our uh our, our our technology to our benefit in that regard other than that it's a lot of facetime it's a lot of phone calls things of that nature really no different than it is during the season. But what unfortunately we've done is remove this, you know, these evaluation periods, right, where now we're able to get in front of and see, you know, five to ten of these guys that we've been recruiting live, you know, in one location, watch them play multiple games on a weekend, things like that, to help take our relationship to the next level. But, you know, we're very focused on relationships and serving our players, and I think that's what we're trying to get across to the recruits. Now, one guy that you uh, coached at Memphis, albeit for three games, is James Wiseman. Um, but you, obviously you were around him all summer. Uh, what was, you know, for people that, you know, watch him, and obviously he's still projected to be, to go as high as number one by some people. Uh, explain to people that maybe are skeptical about the fact that he only played three games and maybe don't know who James Wiseman is as a player, why James Wiseman could go as high as number one and maybe should go as high as one or in the top three or five. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and uh, you know, once a tiger, always a tiger is our philosophy, right? And uh, so, you know, we're really proud of James. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him in the summer during the season, uh, you know, still keep in contact with him today. Uh, he's He's a great kid, first and foremost, just a good person. You know, he's – a guy who has some unbelievable God-given physical tools. And I think that what he's looking to do is match that with a killer instinct. And that's what he's looking to strive for is to build, you know, a deep hearted passion and love for the game. That's going to sustain over a 15 year plus NBA career. And I think that's huge, you know, for, for him, uh, obviously coach Penny has been a huge, you know, instrumental figure in his life. 
right? Helping with his development, helping take him to the next level. And I think that, uh, you know, he's going to continue to rely on coach. And I think that he understands that our entire staff is here for him on his, on his road and his journey. But uh, the thing is, I mean, he's got generational type talent and uh, it's going to be whether or not he can harness that and, and put that out into a product on the floor for whatever team drafts him. But, you know, the, he's the guy that can go in from day one and defensively he can play right away in an NBA game and, and he can fill in the gaps on offense uh, down the road. But, but he's a guy who's got a chance to be very special. Now, you mentioned how, you know, once a Tiger, always a Tiger. Um, but Wiseman's time at Memphis did end a little bit tumultuously with the stuff with the NCAA. And whenever a kid leads a program the way uh, James did, sometimes it leads to questions to not just fans but from scouts. What do you think uh, people don't know about Wiseman's work ethic and his commitment as a teammate and his commitment to the game that you think people should know uh, as he enters his NBA career? Yeah, I think that people don't know that James just wants to be an integral part of the team. Like, he wants to be a, a team member, right? There are some guys who want, want it to be more about them, but he wants to blend. I mean, he wants to be on the team. He enjoys every element of being a part of a team. I know that he enjoys that structure. I know that he was rooting for us from afar, but without question, he was he was missing everything that it was that we were doing. And so that was huge to to – and I think that's the most important thing for people to know and understand is that, you know, he's, he's the type of guy, although, yeah, he did, he made a decision to leave that he felt was best for himself. We all know the NCAA stuff and can pass judgment about, you know, their hand and, and kind of pushing the best talent, you know, away from the college basketball game. Probably not, probably not for the best uh, in terms of, you know, when it comes to, to his development, but also when it comes to the game right, itself and the fans, but at the end of the day, I think that James has such a bright future ahead of him. And it starts with the fact that he wants to be a part of an organization and a part of a culture. And I think that, uh, you know, I mean, if he gets in a locker room like the one they have in Golden State, with those guys coming back with the leadership that they have around, um, you know, he's going to have, have a great opportunity to assimilate into that. And I think that that's what he's looking for is the opportunity to blend with a group uh, and create something special. Now, another NBA prospect that you guys uh, coached last season was Precious Tachua, who came in with some high expectations, and I would say most people would say exceeded them winning conference player of the year. Um, talk about a guy in Precious Tachua who – talk about his value in the modern NBA. Um, you know, we, we're a YouTube channel. We've done a lot of comparisons for a lot of these draft prospects, and, you know, Precious was one of the harder guys to come up with a comparison for – uh, in terms of guys that have played in the NBA in years past or guys that are currently in the NBA. Uh, so talk about his value and what kind of role you see him fitting in at the next level. And maybe if you have one, a comparison for who he reminds you of. Um, yeah, first I was going to ask you who you guys' comps were, just out of curiosity. I've got a couple. I'll drop those at you. What do you guys got for me? Anything? So for me, I I said a a younger, Luol, younger more athletic Luol Deng coming okay. out of uh, I don't know. What about yeah, you, Jay? Yeah, I, I had Sean Marion. He uh, he was one of the toughest ones for me because he's um, he's taller than Sean, but I think mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the ability to rebound and also be a lot threat and guard multiple positions to me, and and, and to show uh, maybe people underestimate maybe his jump shot, but he actually can hit some some threes and he could stretch the floor a little bit, similar to Sean, where people kind of saw his release and didn't respect the shot, but he could actually hit that shot. Especially when he was playing under mm -hmm. Mike D'Antoni. Sean, yeah, Sean. That, that yeah, was oh, yeah. that was my coach. Thinking. D gave the freedom, man. Yeah. So the big thing when you look at Precious, man, Precious is such a dynamic, dynamic player. There's a lot of there's a lot of levels and layers to what he does, and he's capable of doing on the basketball floor. First and foremost, his value mm -hmm. on the defensive side mm -hmm. is huge. Similar to James, but much different than James, right? Similar in that they're both, I think, guys who immediately impact that side of the floor right away but different in that Precious can literally guard all five positions on the floor, right? So in today's switching NBA, particularly as you're trending in the fourth quarter, late game scenarios, when you're going to look to switch everything, and, and even some teams out there are switching everything as a base coverage, you've got to have guys uh, who are mobile enough to contain the bounce, contain elite athletes in space, but uh, then also physical enough, right, to resist uh, bigger players. And then guys who have that instinct to rotate over on the weak side and you know, protect the rim. I think that he does all of those and he, he does them really, really well. Uh, and so that's really where, where I, I find his immediate value. Um, 
And his versatility on the offensive end of the floor. I mean, he's only scratched the surface in terms of his skill set. Uh, he has upside as a shooter. People don't realize he shot almost 33% from the three-point line this year. Uh, and the good thing was is that he was not a volume shooter, right? So he's picking the some some of the right ones to take. And uh, typically when he took those right ones, he made those at a higher higher clip. And so for him, you know, he does have upside. Release is great. He's working on his balance. He's working on controlling his hips. Uh, he does a, a pretty significant right hip rotation, uh, counterclockwise rotation as he shoots. I think once he gets that under control and his balance is right there, uh, you know, you're going to see great upside for him to be an NBA 35% three-point shooter uh, plus. And, uh, and I think that's probably the goal. But really where he's super dynamic is in rolling situations, as a dribble handoff guy, as a screener. And that's the other thing is he can play multiple positions on that, on the offensive side of the ball. He can run to the corners. He can space. He can attack closeouts from the perimeter. I think he'll be really good at, at things like Maggetti cuts and go catches at the NBA level, especially with space. Um, and then he's also a dynamic screener and roller, and he's one of the best at, at catching bad low bounce passes in the pocket, bad low low bounce pocket passes, and exploding right up to the rim and finishing above the rim. And then, you know, we know what he brings on the rebounding side because he's got a high motor. So as he continues to fill in, right, the, uh, that shot again has upside. His ball handling is going to improve. His passing is going to improve. His instincts are already there. And so – you know, he's got a chance to be special. Um, some comps that I have, right, are uh, – uh, and I coached I, – so I coached Montrez Harrell. I coached Bam Adebayo. I think that when he slides to the, quote-unquote, small ball five, specifically into game scenarios and things of that nature, that, uh, that he has a lot of the dynamic traits that those guys have. Uh, Bam and dribble handoffs. Bam catching rebounds and pushing in and nighting the break. Um, and then, you know, same thing with Montrez. Uh, but then when you really think about it, uh, his ability to kind of stretch the floor and play on the outside, if he continues to improve his feel when he decks it, um, you know, he's got an opportunity to have a little Pascal Siakam in there. So, you know, I think we're going to see him sprinkle all those different elements together and and really just become a hybrid version of himself, which I know is what he'll tell us. You know, who are you? Yeah, yeah I'm the first precious. And uh, I think that's going to be something to watch. Yeah, I, I mean, when I watched the tape more impressive when we were preparing for our video, I was, uh, and I watched a lot of Memphis, you know, Kendall being a Memphis fan. I've been impressed with it, him every time I've watched, and I think that he's going to be one of the more underrated players in this draft. Um, moving to your, uh, your, your your time with the Phoenix Suns, uh, with the G League program, and of course um, on the staff as a director of player development. Obviously, their star player is Devin Booker. He certainly has established himself. As a star in this league, he's put up great numbers. He uh, finally re- finally made his first All-Star game uh, this year. But the team uh, has yet to really have a lot of success. They, you know, that Western Conference is tricky, and, they, and they've yet to make the playoffs. Um, you've worked closely with him. You've seen his work after you've seen um, how he trains. Um, well, what do you think about the way he approaches the game? Makes him a, a foundational piece to a team that could be a playoff contender or even a championship contender. Because uh, a lot of people will look at um, the stats, but then maybe see the team result and say, okay, is he this kind of player? Is he patent staff? But I know you have a different perspective considering you saw him up close. I mean, Devin Booker has a 1% mentality, uh, and then he's got a 1% ability to execute at the highest levels. And he is one of the quickest learners I've ever been around. Uh, he's the type of guy you talk about a concept, you talk about a skill, and the amount of time that it takes him to go from the introduction of a, of a new skill, something that's foreign to him, to actually implementing it at the highest levels is so small compared to the rest of, you know, the world, right? In terms of like, hey, some of us will never master these things. I don't care if you're a, a you know, basketball player or whatever the case may be, but some of these things that, that, that he's able to do, it's just, it's remarkable, but it starts with his mindset and then it starts with his work ethic. And then it starts with, his uh, until mentality. And I say an until mentality because he's the type of guy, you know, it says, you say, hey, man, how, how many reps are you going to do on this move until? It's like until, until what? You know, until he masters it, right? So he's going to he's gonna work on it until he masters it. And then once he masters it, everybody else better watch out. But, um, you know, he wanted to be an all-star. He obviously was able to finally accomplish that. Um, he, is, he is not just an all-star level talent. He's a perennial all-star talent. Uh, but he's also a perennial all-star person. I mean, he's a great guy. He treats everyone with respect. And I think that he's continuing to learn and develop as a leader. And one of the things that I took away from the last dance yesterday that a lot of people don't realize is that well, one of my favorite quotes was when Michael Jordan said, leadership has a price. And it does. 
And I think that, you know, young guys coming up when you're, when you're transitioning towards having to become that leader in the locker room, you have to understand that a leader, that doesn't necessarily always mean that you're going to win the popularity contest, right? Because you've got to speak the truth. You've got to live the truth. Um, you know, Kevin Eastman, uh, his former assistant coach for the Boston Celtics, used to talk about how the most important part of a player's DNA is truth. And you've got to be able to, uh, you've got to be able to take it, you've got to be able to tell it, and you've got to be able to live it. And I think that Devin Booker can do all three of those things. So he's going to be great. I mean, we have to remember this is not a, a one-man show either, right? So DeAndre needed time to grow and still needs time to grow. And, uh, you know, obviously he had his issues with the suspension, but he's, he's, uh, he's back and, and, uh, and producing. And, uh, and I think Kelly Oubre obviously is a great piece. question is whether they'll be able to retain him. So right there, you had three solid young pieces to build around. But growth, right, is not instantaneous. And everybody expects microwave success. That's not how it works. You know, you don't build a culture by just popping a frozen dinner in the microwave for, for two minutes and taking it out and expecting it to be just as good as the homemade one made from scratch by a Michelin star chef, right? So yeah. it takes time, right? It takes time to cook it all up, cook those pieces together, build chemistry, build a hierarchy of leadership and then build a worker's DNA uh, in, the, in the entire program. And, I mean, you, you look at it, and I know that, that they're going to be on the cusp of success here down the road. And, uh, you know, that's because Devin is – he's not going to have it any other way, but he's an unbelievable person, and he's a, obviously a great player. And it's funny because you talk about the potential that you see with, you know, that Booker, Aiden, and Oubre core. Um, one of the kind of what-ifs – you know, that people have talked about is what if the Suns would have drafted Luka Doncic in 2018? And obviously you being on the staff at the time, there were some questions about uh, could Doncic and Booker have played together? Could those two, having two initiators like that work? Um, how do you envision that could have played out had you guys ended up with Doncic rather than Aiden? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you've, you've got two incredibly skilled, incredibly talented passers. I think that's underrated. Book Book is an underrated passer. We know Luka Doncic is an elite passer. And, uh, you know, these guys, because really they get a lot of um, excitement from the pass, right? I could just have for sure envision them playing playing very well together. Obviously, we had Igor Kokoshkov as our head coach who had coached uh, uh, Luka in the, for the Slovenian national team to the European Championships, which was a remarkable accomplishment. And, you know, I know those guys had a great relationship. Um there's no question that those two guys could have played, played well together. Um, but there's also no question that, uh, you know, everybody, you, it's very easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, right? You know, and uh, it's a lot harder to make these real-time decisions. DeAndre's an excellent player. He's continued to develop. Those two should be a hell of a pair here moving forward without question. And, again, I mean, they're, they're a few pieces away uh, from having a core. And then they've got to figure out how to build in and supplement their core with, role players who, uh, you know, who can, can stay on, on extended contracts because I think roster turnover uh, has been a big issue in Phoenix. So, you know, familiarity is a deadly weapon in and of itself and at least organic chemistry and organic growth. And uh, so to me, that would be huge, right? Absolutely. And you, and you mentioned, you know, the idea of growing a, a, a team and, 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 kind of having all the pieces come together all at once and how difficult that can be. And that's what Phoenix is trying to work on right now. One of the things I always talk about, and we talk about it with college basketball, the key to uh, the, the, the key to success being the strength in a program, from recruiting, from player development, to the culture, um, everything that goes into the program is important in terms, of, uh, in terms of having sustained success on the college level. And anybody who's listening to this podcast or watching our videos, I often say that to me, um, the same can be said for NBA teams as well. I think well, when you look at you know, the league, of course, it's star-driven, but there are a lot of teams that have had sustained success, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they've really built their organizations almost like a program. I think when you look at the San Antonio Spurs, the Miami Heat, they've been able to uh, have star players you know, leave their prime or retire or go to other teams and still have a, a, a long, a sustained success. Um, do you think that's a fair assessment? And what do you think are the keys to uh, a franchise's ability in the NBA to build that foundation to a strong program? And are there similarities to uh, the college game and what you guys are trying to do at Memphis? Yeah, I mean, I think point blank, 
uh, plain and simple, greatness is consistency, right? So greatness is consistent. What can you do on a regular basis? It's not what can you do when you're at your best, and then what are you doing when you're at your worst, right? It's can you be consistent? And I think that's everything. I, you've mentioned all these great organizations, and that's what they have is consistency, right? And I think that they have consistent leadership. I think that they have built a foundation in terms of consistency on their requirables of their players, right? What it takes to be part of the Spurs DNA, what it takes to be a part of the Miami Heat DNA. I think too many people toss around the word culture, but then what they don't do is they don't defend the culture. And you defend the culture every day with your actions. And I think that's huge. That's If you're not willing to defend what your DNA, what your culture is about, then you don't have culture, right? And so to me, the culture is also, it's, it's kind of like the thermostat in the building right there, right? And you've got to set it and, and it's got to stay consistent. Otherwise, you're going to have mood swings from the players, from the staff, from the front office, things of that nature. So for me, you know, those organizations that you talked about, one, they've got that DNA of defending their culture. And I think that they've built it around some great organizational pieces, pieces that are non-players, right? You've got leadership in the front office, Pat Riley. You've got coaching staff, Eric Spolstra, who, by the way, only reinvents himself every single year, which is unbelievable. Quite possibly the best yeah, coach, I know. you know, that there is in terms of how he changes his offensive and defensive philosophies to fit his personnel, right? Because right? he could very easily just sit back and put his feet up and say, hey, we've done it this way. We'll keep doing it this way. But he's always looking for what's next, and that's what makes him a great coach. And then his players continuing to develop as well, finding undervalued assets and growing those guys. I coached Derek Jones Jr. in the G League, and to see how they've gotten him to continue to grow – has been off the charts. You look at additions like Duncan Robinson, you look at how they merge Tyler Hero in and then bring Kendrick Nunn in from the G League, and it's like they haven't skipped a beat, right? And, you know, you, if you would have said, compared their roster this year to their roster, you know, four or five years ago, and say, hey, Eric Spolster's got to coach this group versus this group, say, well, shoot, Eric Spolster might not be there if he's got to coach the second group, right? Because, you know, that's going to be a hard group to win with, and we all know we're all judged on wins. But I'll tell you this. Uh, Spo is unbelievable, right? And his whole staff, they do a tremendous job. And the front office does a tremendous job in the evaluation process of really getting a thorough evaluation on a player's DNA, which I think is huge. And uh, San Antonio, the same thing. I mean, they've been doing it for decades and decades. And then you look at, you know, kind of how that's spread. And everybody's been trying to chase the quote unquote Spurs culture, right? But, you know, it, it, what you have to do first is you got to look yourself in the mirror. You got to figure out what, like, what are your core values? What are your unwavering? principles that you want to live by that that you're literally going to be on the front lines taking bullets for once you figure out those then you've got to reverse engineer what you want out of your team and i don't think you can just take a cookie cutter approach and say oh we're going to be like the spurs or we're going to be like the heat or we're going to be like no we've got to figure out what we are first and i think that that's what coach penny hardaway has done a great job of is laying this foundation during his two years of what we're going to be, right? We're going to bring, we're going to put put the hard hats on, right? We're, we are going to be blue collar in everything we do. We're going to bring our lunch pails to work every single day. And we are going to find a sort of peace and solace in the work. Uh, and that's going to be on the court, focusing on development first. Uh, we are not chasing wins, right? What we're doing is we're chasing the best versions of ourselves. And I know coach feels very strongly that if we chase the best versions of ourselves on and off the floor, that, that's going to lead to wins, right? So we want to be process driven, not result driven. And I think during that and, and just in that mode, that's when the results come. Uh, just a couple more questions before we get before we can get you out of here, Coach. Um, you know, in in recent weeks, uh, you talked a little bit about you know the NCAA kind of having to step up their game, uh, so to speak. And in recent weeks, obviously, we've seen the G League uh, kind of become a major option for elite high school basketball recruits. Uh, you being a guy that's played in the G League, coached in the G League as an assistant and as, as, and as a head coach, as well as coaching in the NBA, um, but now coaching at a school that is pursuing a lot of elite high school basketball recruits, uh, what would you weigh are, are the pros and cons of kind of joining that G League route? And what are some of the things that you think maybe people are missing out on uh, if they don't go to a school like Memphis? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when you're when you're really looking at it, um, the G League is a tremendous, tremendous platform. I mean, there's countless kids that have gone there and 
been able to carve out a career. And my whole message was always like, don't get a 10 day, get a 10 year. Right. And had guys like Shaq Harrison, who's been able to create his career with the Bulls, Derek Jones Jr., who, you know, found his way out of the league, found his way back into the league. Uh, you know, but I've coached a, a lot of guys who have been able to really, you know, use that platform. Um, I think it makes sense what the NBA is doing. I get it, understand it 100 percent. I think that, you know, they are tired of seeing guys go overseas and do that development stuff. I think that where we reach a sticky situation here is now that, that they're actively recruiting. It's, it's interesting, right? And that's, you know, the, the one thing that disappoints me is when somebody does make a commitment to a college and then signs with the college and then they go back on that. That's a, that's a tough one for me to, to understand. But I'll say this. Uh, at the end of the day, it's still high risk to the player, right? Because what people don't understand is how incredibly good good the talent level is in the g league right um i coached six mcdonald's all americans in the g league right no i coached anthony bennett the former number one overall pick in the g league so none of those guys expected that they were going to be in the g league right when you're a mcdonald's all american you figure you've got the red carpet right to the nba you know i'm going to be making 100 million dollars before i you know when i blink here and that's not how it works for most of them so it's a hunger games level is what it is you know, and, and, and the big thing is when, when it's Hunger Games, right, that, what is that, kill or be killed, right, eat what you kill type mentality, you got to understand there's going to be a certain level of desperation in the players there. And that's why I say there's a risk there, there's a risk to the high school kids because they're playing against grown men, 25, 27, 28 years old, that are hungry to get to the next level, that are only making $35,000. They're trying to provide for their families, right? And so, you know, it'll be really interesting. Again, I think the NBA is smart for putting that platform together. I think that the G League is the is a really, really underrated breeding ground for not just great players but great coaches. We know Nick Nurse came from the G League. We know the long list of of uh, of, of coaches and front office members with G League experience. So it'll be interesting to see how it works out. Um, I don't think it directly is going to impact college basketball as heavily as people are anticipating. Uh, obviously, we miss out on seeing Jalen Green in a Memphis uniform, uh, but you know there's plenty of other great players out there who are. We're really excited about, uh, you know, about Memphis Tiger basketball that hopefully are going to uh, decide to come and join us. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun to see where uh, Coach Penny takes this program in the years to come. Yeah. Um, another question that I want to throw out there, uh, you know, being a guy that uh, has talked about, um, you know, you, you talk a lot about kind of the steps of where you've gone as a coach, um, obviously now ending up at Memphis, how do you feel about, you know, if there's a coach out there watching this video, what are maybe what's the one thing that you would suggest to them in terms of focusing on in their development, their career to hopefully one day be the next Cody Topper? Yeah. I mean, I'll say that first and foremost is, you know, you don't, don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all. And I love that quote because to me, go, you've got to go out and you've got to continually learn. You've got to, have a desire for knowledge. You know, I've been spending a lot of time here uh, watching various coaches clinics, connecting with coaches, asking questions, um, trying to figure out how I can get an edge moving forward. And I think that that's huge, right? Because I think that, you know, when, once you think you've got it all figured out, that's the minute you don't. And uh, the truly great coaches, like the ones we mentioned, the Pops, the Spos, and all the coaches that are underneath him and his program, right? They're always constantly figuring out what's next. And it shows on the floor because their product is, 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 is evolving, right? Their offensive and defensive philosophies are evolving, right? Their development schemes are evolving. And so I think for us, we've got to always be in a constant state of, of, uh, of evolution. And uh, in order to do that, you've got, to, you've got to stay curious and you've got to continue to learn. And I think that's everything. Right now, during this pandemic, we have an opportunity to self-reflect. Uh, I'm by no means a perfect coach. None of us are. And uh, so I'm trying to figure out how better to get through – uh, and help our players. How, how can I better serve our players? I think that's, that's, that's everything. And on the flip side, you know, we spend a lot of time breaking down players' games, and uh, you spent years working out players, scouting elite players. Um, there could be some young players watching uh, or listening to this podcast. What is one thing you think players who are in the gym working on their game should know about what it takes to make it to that high D1 level or that NBA level beyond just, you know, the usual working hard? Yeah, that's what I'll say here. Uh, hard work is the price of admission. That's what I always tell guys. Hard work is the price of admission. That just gets you in the conversation. 
but what determines whether or not you stay is going to be the unrequired work, right? So are you doing the unrequired work? And that is not just getting your own player development sessions in here and there. No, it's what is, what is your DNA? Are you in the building an hour before every practice? Are you taped at least 45 minutes before every practice? Do you have a routine that gets you ready, locked in, dialed in for practice, a player development routine? Are you doing it every day, right? Are you brushing your teeth on the floor? That's what I call it, right? Like I, I separate workouts really into three different things. Brush your teeth, water your plants, and sharpen your sword, right? So before practice, are you brushing your teeth during the season? But now out of season, are you sharpening your sword? Are you figuring out how to expand your role, right? Are you just complaining about a lack of playing time or a lack of shots? Like, what are you doing, right? And I think that that's a big thing. And the first thing that, that that's going to happen to every single basketball player, so I say, is that at some point in time, somebody's going to tell you you can't do something, right? And there are certain guys who sulk, and that next morning they sleep in, their alarm goes off, and they ignore it, right? Or maybe they didn't even set the alarm, so they're sleeping in, right? And it's going to be about what's your next move after somebody tells you you can't do something. Because what we know is the Kobe mentality, the Michael Jordan mentality, if there's anything that we're watching on this, in this last dance, the LeBron mentality, right? When somebody tells me they can't do something, the next day they're going to wake up before their alarm, right? They're going above and beyond to prove those people wrong. They're using that as ammunition uh, in order to – uh, enhance their development. And I think that's huge. So that's, that's my big thing is, you know, as a player, you've got to, got to, got to have an absolute DNA of doing unrequired work. And if you don't, if you don't have that in your DNA, then you're going to have a short lived career because it's one thing I, I, and I remember I dropped off Tyler Johnson <clears throat> at the Miami heat, I actually drove him to his workout. I drove him to his first day of summer league practice. And uh, this is what I said, man. First step is getting in the building. But the real challenge is staying there. Wow. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great way to put it. Uh, Memphis Tigers assistant coach Cody Topper, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you guys. You guys have a great one. Everybody out there, be safe. All right, you too. Stay safe.